Hello, I'm Arthur Gaudet. To establish my qualifications, I began my transit career 53 years ago in 1969 as a bus cleaner and fueler. Subsequently, I was an operator, instructor, supervisor, and dispatcher. I've also served as general manager, CEO, on multiple transit systems. Over 30 years ago, I founded Arthur N. Gaudet & Associates Incorporated, providing consulting services focusing on scheduling and service planning, particularly from an operations perspective. Seeing a need for training, I developed the two-day run cutter course, teaching the knowledge and art of scheduling. With or without scheduling software, we need to understand the basics and trade-offs to generate the best solution for the transit system as a whole. My experience led to writing two books, Improving On-Time Performance in the Transit Industry, a Practical Guidebook, and Managing the Scheduling Function, a Guide for Transit Executives. Both books can be purchased from my website, runcutter.com, which also has information on the Runcutter course and OTP workshops. This presentation will discuss the nationwide driver shortage. This is not a new COVID-related phenomenon. Years before COVID, systems were struggling to hire drivers. But since COVID and the Great Resignation, we have seen service reductions throughout the country due to the driver shortage. A recent report said that national ridership is back to 70% of pre-COVID, but systems are reporting that operators are leaving faster than they can be replaced. Needed service has been cut and continues to be cut in many cities. This critical stage requires rethinking our approach. Changing the historical approach, though, has led to at least one transit system increase of service, and I'll discuss that success story later. I'll discuss retention and recruitment, ideas based on my experience. Not formal research, but thinking about some of the things I would do, or at least consider, if I were back in my general manager role. Some may be controversial, some may be a little hard to swallow. Of the five musts for on-time performance, number three is having enough operators. Having enough operators is affected by musts one, two, and five. So of our five musts, four involve operators. As an operator, I remember running city routes with insufficient running times, thus no recovery. Catching one route for two consecutive 13-hour days as a standby operator was enough. If I was forced to drive that route for a bid period as a low seniority operator, I'd pro probably change jobs. The operator's interactions with all levels of management is crucial. Negative interactions, lack of feeling valued also lead to reconsidering employment. We're going to see a graphic example of that later. By the way, there are resources for training front level supervisors. The National Transit Institute has a course, Transitioning from Frontline Employee to Frontline Supervisor. The Community Transportation Association of America offers the course, Certified Community Transit Supervisor. So help is available beyond just on-the-job training. Clock face headways may work on paper, but not on the street. Four pounds of sugar in a three pound bag, stretching the rubber band to the breaking point. The city route I call, recall driving was extended to a shopping center in the afternoon. It was virtually impossible to make schedule. There was no recovery. We had a scheduled 60 minute cycle time, even though it would have been much more realistic at 65 or 70 minutes. Exacerbated by heavy school ridership on one mid-afternoon trip, it was miserable. That's why I still remember it 50 years later. Should we redesign the route? Shorten the route? Should we abandon the clock face for some alternative? 30-minute pulses become every 35 or 40 minutes? 60-minute pulses become every 70 minutes? Or should we push operators in safety? maybe even lying to the public 
by publishing unsustainable schedules. Too many time points can force running early past time points early along the route. Perhaps leading to discipline is yet another frustration. Certainly those earlies lead to poor on-time performance metrics and they're not the operator's fault. This example shows a real bus route, made anonymous, with 21 time points in the one hour cycle time. Trailing a bus, the operator was seen to be one or two minutes early past the first several time points. By the middle of the bus route, he was on time. He risked discipline for running early to ensure that he arrived back downtown at the end of the cycle in time to make transfer connections for his passengers. Best practice, by the way, is a time point about every 10 minutes. The bottom table shows the same schedule, but using that best practice. Driver assistance devices can add frustration. On this system, all the public timetables say is that the service is going to run every 10 minutes. Dynamic spacing is not feasible, so a schedule is used for drivers to maintain spacing and place the operator at the relief point at the proper time. The display shows that the bus is on time, but the spacing is off. Six minutes behind the leader, 15 minutes ahead of the follower. Should the operator slow down to even out the gap and risk discipline for being off schedule? Or should the operator remain on schedule, not risk discipline, but put the blame on the other buses? Another type of device shows colored status indications for schedule adherence. Red, yellow, green, but it cannot reflect the range of real speeds along the route segment probably highway versus school zones. An operator can do the right thing while the display says that they're wrong. That conflicting display, that distracting display, is the equivalent of a GPS yelling at us to turn left even though we see our destination straight ahead. Distractions are both safety hazards and frustrations. Restroom opportunities are limited and often worrisome for operators. The photo shows a stop at a fast food restaurant frequently used for operators to take their restroom breaks. Buses block traffic and delay service. Here, the added safety hazard is shown as one of those stopped buses was rear-ended by an automobile. Particularly ironic, the end of the line is about seven minutes further on at a light rail station with no bus driver restroom. One moderately large transit system told me they replace about 200 seat cushions a year because they're soaked with human, urine rather. They could not tell how many were driver's seats. Pretty straightforward, but maybe not at the top of the concern list. If the operator's room is as unattractive as the wash bay, does it instill pride? Numerous studies available online even discuss how colors affect productivity and mood. Do we provide, provide a professional uniform? Do operators have confidence in equipment? Or does this add to a feeling of being disesteemed, devalued? Let's first look at some no-cost ways to improve morale. New operators may be more fragile, less resilient, as they are feeling their way into the organization and gaining confidence. Some systems report that senior drivers intimidate new drivers, perhaps unintentionally, by telling them war stories. New drivers don't have the standing to then ask them why they stayed if things are so bad, so it's up to management to minimize or offset the creation of bad attitude. Relationships will naturally develop. I recall visiting a property in the 1980s where operators proudly stated that they worked for the union, not for the transit system. Fuel was added to the fire as management fought allowing union stickers and patches on buses and uniforms. 
Perhaps one way to instill positivity is to establish a mentorship program among operators, perhaps with union involvement. Aside from team building, the goal is to increase the success rate of newer operators lowering turnover. Selectivity is important. Further, we need to consider what incentives are appropriate for anyone who serves as a mentor. One way or another, a team will be built. Should it take the example I just mentioned where operators thought their employer was the union? Or should it be a team of everyone serving the public? How do we minimize that us versus them? Spend time with individual employees. Learn their names. Get out on the street. Ride and listen, especially with new operators. Not just 9 to 5 on weekdays, but at night, on weekends. Respect the odd hours they work by working them ourselves. Listen and learn. The Los Angeles video follows a new operator, from hiring, through training, to turn in, helping some of us remember those early days, helping others who didn't come up through the ranks to get that experience vicariously. Many episodes of the show Undercover Boss display senior managers who obviously do not understand the workers or the work involved to generate the product or service. Let's do what we need to to make sure that we are not that guy that doesn't know which end of the broom to use. We'll address running and recovery times in a moment, but we also need to recognize that transit has needs beyond the office nine to five job, nights and weekend, Split shifts are characteristic of transit. Any job conflicts with personal and family needs. As society has changed though, particularly since COVID, family often comes before employment, a factor that we must acknowledge. So now let's talk about running time. Remember the route that I mentioned with insufficient running time, how frustrating that was and how that could have led me to resign. So our point in getting the running time right is to use the available data, but use it wisely. We should be spending time on the street anyway, so let's ensure that there is no disconnect between computer data and the real world. Let's also acknowledge the value of operators and operator knowledge. The people who actually do any job have knowledge that is not available from any computer program. Recovery is both the shock absorber for any anomaly along the route and the operator's opportunity to take care of restroom and nutri nutrition needs, as well as just take a breather before the next trip. From the 1947 scheduling manual published by the American Transit Association, predecessor to APTA, through republications and revisions, including those of the Transit Cooperative Research Program, guidelines are mentioned. The guideline used to be about 10% of running time as recovery, about six minutes per hour. More recently, experience has shown that an appropriate recovery time is more like 15% of cycle time, about nine minutes per hour. Increasing use of mobility devices and bike racks has been a factor in that change. Some argue that standards and guidelines aren't needed, mathematics should rule. But rules of thumb give us a sense of reasonableness. If we're starting off on a long trip, it is helpful to look at the map first rather than let a mathematical GPS algorithm mislead us. The University of Southern California research studied the Los Angeles MTA. Statistically, they determined that 15% recovery time is about right to support on-time performance. The first step we have to go through 
is to decide how many operators we really need once we reach full staffing. Let's define full staffing. Perhaps first, we want to study our night and weekend service. Are we providing the right amount? Or are we providing too much? Is there an alternative, possibly shifting to non-CDL work? Managed overtime offsets the per capita fringe benefits for additional operators. If we have 440 hours of service to cover in a week, we can use 10 drivers, each averaging 44 hours a week, or 11 drivers with zero overtime. Our 10 driver option is going to cost us 20 pay hours of overtime, the halftime penalty pay. However, driver number 11 is going to require the full freight of additional per capita fringe benefits. Probably about a break even. By the way, I believe a 44 to 47 hour a week is not unreasonable. Much above that raises safety issues, not to mention possible absenteeism increases for tired drivers who have full wallets. So where do we normally see the highest turnover? Systems around the country have consistently said the highest turnover is new employees at the bottom of the seniority list. Where does all of the bad work go? Traditionally and historically, it's put together to be picked by those newer drivers. That worked for previous generations of employees who had the patience to wait for long-term benefits, a career. But future pensions, weekends off in 10 years, don't cut it today. So how do we make a gradual change and to what level? Certainly a goal of full equality. Everyone from seniority number one to seniority number 250 is foolish. Morally, a 25 year operator should not have to work nights and weekends unless they choose to. Any union would fight and probably win an arbitration with or without a strike. But is there some cutoff point below which we can mix work? Enough good so they'll stay? Perhaps enough bad to make them look forward to getting above that line and having weekends off, better work for the rest of their career? How do we meet the needs of our business and our passengers if our historical approach no longer works? We find ways to get creative. Maybe we find ways to get operators some weekend off days. Years ago, the Transit Authority of Northern Kentucky used a three week rotation for its four day work weeks. So at some point in that three week cycle, operators were able to take six consecutive off days. Note with any rotation, we also need to keep operators on consistent sleep patterns, lest fatigue compromise safety. Other ways to spread the pain by shifting from our historical new drivers suffer everything approach. Here are some examples. People generally do not like working nights, but if the work is straight, we have that compromise, the sweet and sour, good and bad. Any roster that has hard days has some easy days. A tough or tight bus route is interlined with an easier route. Weekend work is all straight. Then if we roster it for consecutive weekdays off, we have more good stuff. Transit implies splits. So any roster with splits is rostered for weekdays only with Saturday and Sunday off. Four day work weeks have benefits. If used to cover weekend work, the result is three weekdays off. Operators are now available for day off work. We increase the number of Saturday and Sunday days off 
for five-day rosters. Here's an example of that. In this case, we're using five drivers to cover weekend work. Sweet and sour, the sour being weekends, the sweet being three days off. By the way, in many systems, routes serving weekends are easier to drive, less traffic, perhaps less ridership, than the work on weekdays. Weekdays off work for golfers. Doctor appointments don't require missing a day of work. I will attest that shopping for groceries takes half the time on a weekday than it does on a weekend. This pattern, as I just mentioned, also creates five weekday runs, Monday through Friday, that can have Saturday and Sunday off, benefiting even more drivers. Now let's start to talk about money. We need to analyze our costs. The cost of turnover, let's focus on what we're really dealing with here is a voluntary quit. Let's hypothesize a system with 60 buses, 120 drivers. We're going to drill down our costs just as we do when we use the transit three-part cost model instead of gross system costs when we're trying to evaluate the cost of a service change. Our system with 60 buses and 120 drivers may have four people in HR, $250,000 HR budget. If 50% of HR is dedicated to recruitment, there's $125,000 a year spent on recruitment. Now let's replace one driver. A high failure rate may mean that we need to hire and train four drivers just to get one successful driver. Four weeks of training pay, 120 hours at $15 an hour is $1,800 per person. To account for FICA and workers' comp, let's just round that up to $2,000. So now our four drivers is $8,000 in pay. But if three of them fail to make the grade, now our sole remaining driver cost all $8,000. Training also costs staff time and materials. Add that, the HR cost allocation, and perhaps we're up to $10,000 for an each, each new operator who completes training. That may be good, that may be a low guesstimate. You're going to use your own numbers. Maybe we can improve the quality of applicants through investment to increase the success rate, but what if we invest the wasted money into elements so that we do not lose the operator in the first place. We don't have the voluntary quit. Our analysis should reveal investable money. Invest in higher wages, fringes, benefits designed to improve retention rather than throwing the money away on unsuccessful trainees. Let's note Lower turnover may also reduce HR costs and training department costs and FTEs in both departments. So be aware that some people in those jobs have a vested interest in keeping turnover high. Not likely, but we must be aware of possible resistance so that we can overcome it. Our investments should consider both short-term low seniority and longer-term mid to high seniority operators. <clears throat> One consideration is timing. We have shifted to an environment of instant gratification. So is promising future benefits, long term, like pension, or longevity bonus that is earned in 10 years. Is that an effective method to stem voluntary quits today, particularly at the lower end of the seniority list? Longevity pay is the equivalent deferred gratification of I shall gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Can we calculate the effectiveness of longevity pay? Hiring bonus. If we postpone it, if we delay too long, it's pie in the sky. 
but if we give the hiring bonus too early, is the operator going to take the money and run? We have semi or non-traditional. A recent transit media report discussed a transit system that negotiated a labor agreement including night and weekend premium pay. Something else we may consider as a recruitment bonus as current employees recruit other workers after that recruit has met some longevity criteria. But we also need to question who gets that recruitment bonus. If HR and management are only doing their jobs, then perhaps they should not be eligible for additional recruitment bonuses. Moving from that discussion of retention, we'll now talk about recruitment. Decades ago, a bus driver was a decent, respectable job. Ralph Cramden versus Ed Norton, especially when Ralph had enough seniority to work weekday only straights. Now though, throwing packages for Amazon may pay more and have more benefits. Delivering packages, DoorDash, driving for Uber or Lyft gives people more control over their hours and they become, or at least think that they have become their own boss. A billboard in the South solicits workers for a chicken processing facility at $24 an hour. Meanwhile, bus drivers at a nearby transit system earn $19.79 per hour. Yes, chicken processing is likely harder, dirtier work, the hours may be better, and with a family to feed, money and take-home pay are motivators. Restaurants and supermarkets will say that their vacancies are because, quote, nobody wants to work. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, though, tells a different story. This monthly report is available on the BLS website. Comparing June of 2019 pre-COVID with June of 2022, arguably post-COVID, we see that in 2019, the workforce participation rate was 62.9%. Three years labor, three years later, it's only down seven tenths of a percent to 62.2. That may be reflective of people who took early retirement. We may see reflection of the gig economy of people claiming self-employment, driving for Uber, throwing packages. The net loss of the workforce is about a half a million. That half million loss is only three tenths of 1% of the entire workforce, <clears throat> or a half percent of participants, not very significant statistically. So our interpretation is that anyone who wants to work is working. Unemployment virtually consistent at a relatively low 3.7, 3.6%. They're not out there. It's not a matter of people don't want to work. They are already working. So a job fair, advertising in the newspaper, other passive approaches rely on the candidate to take the initiative. If that worked globally, we would not be seeing TV advertisements for cars, toothpaste, furniture. Advertisements are outreach designed to create both awareness and demand. So, should we be passive? Just hold a job fair and hope? Or should we take the initiative that we need to, to staff up and provide service to our passengers? Athens, Georgia, Durham, North Carolina, are two properties with which I'm familiar that hire drivers at age 18. Athens recruits from high schools. Speaking of active recruiting, doesn't the military have active recruiting stations, often near high schools? Or do they rely on potential recruits to take the initiative? I believe those active recruiting stations 
sell the job and the benefits, creating awareness and demand. Many retirees want something to do, at least part-time, to have a reason to get up every day. Recently, the Afghan refugee crisis was a rapidly developing issue. Many were truck drivers or mechanics serving the U.S. military. Before the Afghan crisis, we had other crises, including Syria. Wouldn't it be a win-win if transit found a way to integrate refugees into this ready resource? A recent report mentioned that one of the national management and operating companies was actively recruiting refugees. A win-win. We have driver seats to fill. Refugees need work. Let's move on. Are our age-old restrictive background standards disqualifying someone for a minor offense years ago? Are those standards still valid? Or are they now out of date? So how do we actively recruit? Who are candidates? I suggest folks who now face the public for whom a transit career may be a step up, maybe socially as well as economically. I have run into fast food counter workers who are not only friendly but went the extra mile. The produce attendant at my grocery store is always busy, always working, and friendly with customers. He also works part-time at a dollar store, as well as part-time at the grocery store. He's a perfect candidate for increased pay with benefits. Now let's think about words transit as a career. If we promote from within, and I believe we should, should we not be able to market that opportunity for advancement as part of a recruiting strategy? The U.S. Department of Labor has grant money available for certain classes. I've also been informed that there may be tax credits for programs such as hiring parolees. Are there programs through our local school system, perhaps community colleges, that provide opportunities? if not for drivers, perhaps for mechanics. Remember instant gratification? How about benefits for today, not just tomorrow? English as a second language class, GED classes for employee and the spouse, college investment money for the kids shown today on every pay stub. Develop a brochure, perhaps a large postcard, something tangible you can hand out. Don't rely on people taking that extra step of searching out a website. Brochures don't have to cost much. Brochures such as the one I'm showing here are quite cost effective I use an online company, Vistaprint, where you design your own brochure or postcard. It's printed and it shows up on your doorstep a few days later. We need to be honest. OC Transpo in Ottawa, Canada has the bus driver job posting on their website. In it, while some of their requirements seem stiff, they also describe very honestly the bad side of the job faced by new recruits. Another way to ensure that recruits understand what they face until they build up seniority is to get the family involved at the recruitment phase. Maybe the final interview with someone in operations, not HR, includes the spouse. We describe the bad along with the good. That may also go a long way to increasing the employee's support at home. An example we're going to mention shortly is a system that was able to increase service. Part of their approach was to change the requirement for English fluency to having an adequate command of the language. 
Their thought is that many can speak the language but do not consider themselves fluent. Notably, one of the cities that they serve has only 30% of the population claiming English as a first language. The grocery produce worker I mentioned earlier might need an ESL, English as a Second Language class, if only to build his confidence, perhaps generating a great worker for a small investment. Child and senior care are issues. Austin, Texas has had a successful daycare adjacent to their main operating facility for a long time. If your garage is ad adjacent to your transit center, this could also help passengers caring for children or seniors, maybe even be a revenue generator. For new hires, is the lack of a way to work a barrier? Perhaps we need to consider a transportation allowance at some point, an allowance for Uber, Lyft, or some other method to ensure that bus drivers can get to work. A recent Transit Summit presentation discussed a transit system that recruits previously incarcerated individuals as mechanics. Their state prison system offers diesel mechanic training. Selective recruiting, also for operators, may be another win-win. This is not being a, just being a do-gooder. Perhaps there is a valid business case that will have multiple benefits. The district attorney, the parole and probation department may have as much interest in returning folks to society as we do in filling bus driver seats. They may be a resource in program development. Police and fire departments have chaplains. Is that something that we might consider? Previously incarcerated people I know personally have a valuable, perspe per valuable perspective. I'm going to risk calling that inside knowledge. In the words of one, and I quote, most offenders that are looking for jobs are willing to work hard and are looking for a job with some stability that they could possibly make a career and they're looking to learn something new, end quote. But it's going to be essential to get out in front of the story with both the media and current employees. We are going to want to get media support by getting out in front of the story rather than risk crucifixion and misinterpretation later. We normally consider a trainee who fails to turn in or to make it through probation as the employee not making the grade. But a question should also be whether we have anything in our training program that encourages voluntary dropouts. Bad attitudes, rules that even a trainee might think dumb discredit the organization. One ex example is a system I saw that pays for uniforms very early in the training, despite knowing that they have a high failure rate. Not only is that a waste of money, but it's something that's going to make even the trainee question management's decisions. Is an evaluation of your training department needed? Maybe some ways to evaluate training. Operations management, senior management, spends a little time with the trainees in an informal meeting. No trainers in the room. Go off the record. Maybe it's one-on-one. -on -one. We're trying to determine how things are going and whether there are any problems, whether trainees are satisfied. Again, we learn by listening. When the union gives its presentation, we want to be sure that there's management representation just in case the union says anything that isn't entirely true. Again, I have seen an example where the union, at a system where membership was not required, tried to increase membership by telling trainees that management's only goal was to find ways to fire people. 
we may have an asset coming up. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration is experimenting with a modernized commercial driver license skills test, focusing on day-to-day -day skills rather than some of the arcane detail we have seen in the past. The last report was that it is in a three-state pilot program. The theory is that it will be a shorter training program and an easier test, more focused on what is needed day to day. So after operators turn in, where may we see more voluntary dropouts or terminations? What is the hardest job for operators? The extra board. Where do most newly turned in operators go? The extra board. So are we setting up new operators for failure by giving the newest person the hardest job? So now we have covered both retention and recruitment. Let's now turn our attention to another possibly indirect cause of voluntary quits. Many of us have had supervisors or managers that caused heartburn. Remember, there are competing job openings elsewhere. Do we have supervisors or managers that are responsible through their attitude, through their approach, responsible for voluntary quits? If a supervisor's or dispatcher's job is to support, how does an answer, quote, do the best you can, fulfill that goal? Thinking back to being an operator, if I called an operator, uh, called a dispatcher and I got that response, my response is that I'm already doing the best I can. That's why I called you to ask for help. One thing senior management may consider is having the company radio frequency available on to monitor how operators are supported, as well as be able to monitor, monitor service issues in a real-time basis. Note that supervisors can be the next generation of transit managers. Therefore, they are worth investment. Remember, too, the earlier mention not only of training programs for supervisors, but the possibility of career advancement as a differentiator in recruiting new drivers. So first a note, these videos I'm about to show are available on YouTube. I contacted the television station. The TV station sent me to YouTube when I requested permission to use the videos. They also referred me to the YouTube fair use policy, which is why I am playing these here. So let's listen to an example of non-support from supervisors. Obtained by the WBRZ investigative unit through a public records request shows the driver noticed a problem. I have a check engine light on, on this bus and the, it's not going over 15 miles an hour. Yeah, it was anything but normal. 12 minutes pass and the situation on bus 202 became worse. Drivers we talked to declined to go on camera out of fear of being fired, but all of them say the situation put the public safety at risk. They say it also exposes a big disconnect between dispatch and the people who are driving the buses. So here's bus 202. Yes, there was some air pollution. By the way, did you notice that the dispatcher did not even call the operator by name, just referring to her as operator? Calling operators by their name is a sign of respect. Respect fosters the sense of belonging. The most, the most dramatic, dramatic fire, fire of the year was, was this one at the Mall of Louisiana, Louisiana as, as a cat's, cat's bus, bus was engulfed in flames. It may be tough to change years of institutional inertia. Selling new concepts, risk-taking are hard. 
Here's an example reported by the transit media where management's efforts were rejected by the board and service was cut. Proposed hiring and retention bonuses were rejected by the board who stated they were afraid that the additional pay would contribute to inflation. Passengers suffered. Good news though is another example in Massachusetts where a new approach resulted in hiring enough operators to increase service, increase frequencies, for the first time in at least 60 years. Wages were increased, language requirements were made more reasonable, as I already mentioned. They marketed the job, not just having a job fair and hoping for the best. The 60-minute frequencies that have been in place for over six decades are going to become 30-minute headways. Headwinds, opposition. So from labor, why might we see some opposition to our efforts? Does the union make more money from initiation fees, resulting from a high turnover, than from dues from longer term members? Do two to five year operators pose a threat for future union elections? Then, then there's the concept from senior operators. I suffered for years, you should suffer too. You shouldn't have it any better than I had it. Fear of change, institutional inertia. Notable in any effort to restructure the run cut, the roster, or anything else to be more equitable to junior operators. The first mention here is an old story. Management distributed turkeys at Christmas. The union grieved the unilateral benefit for which they had not bargained. By the way, this is not a transit story, this is another company. The arbitrator sided with the union, no more Christmas turkeys. Implementation could be over a trial period, perhaps with a side letter of understanding. Share the credit. If the union local is reticent, how do we solve the staffing and retention crisis? Perhaps to see the big picture, we may need to get the international involved. Let's prepare for some backlash. Once we reach full staffing, the unscheduled overtime we're spending now, that windfall money will be reduced. Reduced overtime is reduced take-home pay after years or months of spending that windfall. Reduced take-home pay could lead to voluntary quits from over older operators, early retirements, now maybe not if pension is a function, it could lead to a decrease in morale. We need to be aware. If you can only manage what you measure, we want to monitor success and failure. Be ready to pivot. The goal is to reach full employment as ridership is returning post-COVID. If you find successful approaches, Share that with the industry through presentations, APTA, CTAA, write an article for Metro, Mass Transit Magazine, whatever you can do to reach the broadest audience. If you tried something that didn't work for you, the information is equally valuable and it may work somewhere else. So, let's close. I would like to thank you for your time. As I mentioned earlier, both of my books are available through my website, runcutter.com. If you want to discuss my two-day Runcutter course, my on-time performance workshop, or any of the other consulting work that I do, please email me or call me. Again, thank you very much for your time and for your attention.